In previous videos, we talked about a lot of cool accessories available for the Siemens breakers. And one that I am really impressed with is this COM100 module that's going to allow us to pull the breaker data off of this and put it on Modbus TCP. Now, it's also available in other languages, but I wanted a variety of options for communications on our smart training cell. So in this video, let's talk about how we can pull this data into Studio 5000 over Modbus. Now, a lot of you are probably thinking, well, wait a second, I didn't think that uh, Studio 5000 had Modbus TCP in it. Well, it doesn't. But Rockwell Automation wrote an add-on instruction, and it's in their sample code library. So just go to their sample codes, and you can download the Modbus TCP AOI. And I already have videos on exactly how to download it and everything, so I'm not going to go deep in the weeds on that part. But mainly, in the manual, we have Modbus TCP Client, Modbus TCP Server. And in the case of the Siemens 3BA6, or more specifically, in the case of the COM100 module, it is the server. We are going to be the client to it. So we're going to be looking at the client AOI. So let's start with a new copy of Studio 5000. And we go down a little bit. We will need these pages here in just a little while, but let's see how we're supposed to do this one. Ah, we're supposed to open up a ladder routine and right-click an empty area and import rungs. Let's open up our main program and open up our main routine. And then let's right-click import rungs. And now we'll grab the TCP client, open it up, finish that. And that'll bring everything in here. And it actually creates all your tags for you. Then next. We are going to monitor the ref connection parameters. So we'll go ahead and right click the ref connection and monitor and open up the arrow by it. And okay, we have a local slot address, destination address, and destination port. So our local slot, and they get really good descriptions in all these. But for the most part, your local slot will be zero unless you have a control logic that happens to have its processor in a slot other than the zero. And then your destination address is going to say, where do you want to go read this data from? So that we will need to fill out. So we're going to put in that one, 192.168.20.84. And we'll click OK. OK, next. It's telling us to go and configure one of our transactions. So let's go down to our client transactions, and we're going to configure transaction zero. And the first thing we're going to need to do is understand our transaction types. And if we mouse over this, it actually gives us some decent data. And whoops, I can't move my mouse right there. But if you look down there, we have holding register read, that's a value of three. And that's what we're going to be doing here. And if you scroll back up, then we can see exactly why I'm saying that. It says to read holding registers, and that's what the COM100 is holding. We're going to use a function code of three. And then we have a station ID. This is 126. So in the previous video on our power config, we found that the 3VA6 was communicating through the COM100 module. And if we go to its communications parameters, then it says the breaker address is 126. So that's where we're getting that number from. Next, we need the beginning address. And this is where it can get challenging. It's basically when we're doing my bus because... We need a piece of data that we can actually read right now. So from the last video, we learned about the power config. And let's go ahead and look at some of our parameter data. So let's look at our measurements. Then voltage would be an easy one to find. So we have our L1 to L2 voltage. And right now it's 127 volt. And remember, I'm running 120 volt through that breaker. That's why it's much lower than yours probably will be. If we look at the mapping from that breaker 
our L1 to L2 should be register address 20. Now, one thing you have to learn about my bus is you do have to be patient. 20 may work for us. It may be 21, and it may be 19, but we're going to find out together. So, oh, and another thing, while we're here, uh, notice this says FP32. That's going to be important in a second. That's a floating point 32-bit number. But all right, let's try this and see what happens. So we'll go over to Studio. And for our beginning address, we're going to put 20 in. And then we have a count. And it says the number of items to read. I believe that is going to be four, but we're going to find out together. So I'll put a four in there. And then we need to enable that read. So we're going to enable the read. And our transaction says zero. I believe that means it's okay. So now we want to go see what type of data we actually got out of this. So if we go up to our client data and we look in the 4,000 range, then we ain't got squat. Now, a lot of y'all are probably looking at this thinking, well, yeah, Tim, of course you don't have anything in it. I mean, I, I tell you folks all the time, I've got hundreds of hours. Forgot to turn the machine back on, cable laying in the floor, or in this case, yeah, I did all this offline. So yeah, we need to download this program. Oof. Now, if you need any help downloading your program or configuring your drivers, then just click down in the description. We have a video that will walk you through all those steps. And we put it back in run mode. And, okay, we still don't have any data, which I was kind of surprised that we wouldn't have an error. And so we look at it, and we have a negative one on our transaction, and that means exception. Now, a couple things. Uh, one, and that's why I knew, I was like, I missed a step somewhere, and if I got an over here, I would have seen I didn't have green bars before. But we need to enable the client. So we'll put a one there, and it does say we're, we're connected. Okay. Okay, we still have a negative one. And honestly, this goes to that part, which kind of, you know, one day somebody will be able to explain exactly why, but I put money, you know, I entered 20 here. I bet you it's supposed to be 19. So let's just enter a 19. And okay, our error goes away. Well, except I just caught one other thing. These are not in decimal. These are in hat. So this value right here needs to be 20 and X. And so if we pull out a scientific calculator, or not scientific, we pull out a programmer calculator, if we enter a value of 20 and hex, that would be a decimal value of 32. And then we're going to subtract that crazy one that sometimes we have to do. So let's see if 31 works. So I enter 31. Okay, I don't have an error. Let me go see if I have data up here. Okay, and I have some data. And now here's the trick is 17,146 doesn't mean anything to us. Now we got to do a little ciphering. Is so it says that this is an FP32. That means it's a floating point number 32 bits. 32 little ones and zeros. And this is 16 little ones and zeros. And so while it may not matter, since it, you feel it may not matter since it has a zero right now, the other 16 bits are in this. So we're going to have to combine and work with these two to figure out exactly what to do. So let's go ahead and bring down a new wrong. And honestly, this is about how I normally do this. Uh, I wish I could say I had a really great science behind this, but. We're going to go to the Move Logical tab. I'm sorry, we're going to go to the File Miscellaneous tab and bring down a CPS instruction. And then we're going to copy that first. Ooh, and I just saw that change. We've got some live data. I don't know what this is, but we've, we've got, we probably have the number we're looking for. We're going to copy that. And we're going to put that into the source. And then for my destination, I'm going to put Combine. And this part is very important. This is an int or a 16-bit number. Now, we know we need to combine those 32 bits. So let's go and look at the help of the CPS instruction. 
And mainly, let's look at this length. So the length is the number of destination elements to copy. And when it says destination, it's counting bits. It is not looking at it from a count of numbers or anything. So we're going to right-click it, New. We're going to leave it as default data type of D-I-N-T. And we're going to make it the length 1. Now, this may be the right number. Now, but in the end, we know it's supposed to be a floating point number. So that combined those two numbers. I'm actually going to copy and paste this, Control-C, Control-V. And then I'm going to take the combined as my source and my destination. I'm going to put combined float. Now, it almost rarely works this perfectly, so we probably have a little more work to do, but let's go ahead and create this as a real, because that will be your floating point number. And okay, just so we can see both of these, we're going to go to our compare tab and bring down an EQU, or I'm in 36, so it's now an EQ instruction. And we're just going to put combined equals combined float. And then our really neat trick is I'm just going to drag any instruction down, and I'm going to type NOP. And that's just making it where I can see these two values really easy. And we're going to finalize that. Then, okay, there's the 1746 that, or 17,146 that we already have, and we ended up with crazy gibberish. I mean, we're some number to the minus 41st in scientific notation. So almost always, this means that this data came in the wrong order. Now, we hope that it's as simple as this number should be number one, and this number should be number zero. That's where I'm going to start at. And to do that, we are going to use a swap byte instruction. And usually I'll just drag any old thing down, but let me see if I can find it really quick. Sit on, yep, on the move logical tab. So we're going to start a run at it. I bring down an SWBP, and I'm going to stick it right here. And then we're going to take our combined, and we have several different order modes, but I am going to start with a word. And then I'm going to put that into swapped. Very important. We're going to right-click, new, and leave this at a double integer. And then I'm going to take that swapped and copy it to that floating point number and finalize that. And there is our 125 volt. If we go to our power config, well, last check on it, it was 127, but that is that value right there if we were to hit the refresh on this. So I know that was a lot of work to figure that piece right there out. Now, Let's talk about what you could actually do with that is, first of all, we could simply extend the number of elements that we're reading. So actually earlier, I think I was wrong anyway. All we needed a two right here to do this. We could make this 500 and read a chunk of my bus data at one time, but that's going to tie up our network and maybe we're only using two or three values. So I am not going to walk you through this, but if I get enough interest in this, I will show how I did this, is I wrote a scattered MyBus read instruction. And so if we go over here, and first I'll just give you a little idea of what I ended up doing. So you can see this number right here is indexing. And so what I am doing is I am handpicking the data, now I didn't actually go through that because, yeah, the, it, this is why you have to handpick the data is literally we're starting at address two. And this actually goes to address number ridiculous. There's on um, 5,000 something. So there's a lot of data in here. So I handpicked the ones that I thought that we would really need. But you notice that number just went back to zero. So I'm just rotating through here, cherry picking the data. And if somebody really wants to see how I did this, then if there's enough people in the comments that ask about this, then I will share a video on how exactly I did this.
you know, I hate that one step in the mod bus where it's like, okay, let me try 20. Whoops, I forgot it was hex. Oh, now we need to subtract one. Honestly, it seems like you have to do that every time with mod bus. That's why people complain so much about it. But, you know, it is a very universal protocol and it is still a very commonly used protocol. And that's why I wanted that particular module. Could have gotten Prothenet, I could have gotten Ethernet IP. But yeah, that, was, that will be an invaluable lesson for people coming into our training center. And this will be an invaluable lesson for you. Now, we still got a few more devices to configure before we can put this whole thing together and make the system work. So here's a playlist that'll keep you moving through this series.